Welcome to this demonstration of solutions in EcoStructure Control Expert to implement Ethernet IP explicit messaging with the function blocks offered in the general purpose library. Please bear in mind that this is a basic demonstration not intended to replace any formal product training. The user might also need to adapt the configuration shown to the actual project requirements. This presentation is structured in three chapters, each one starting at the time indicating on the slide. You might have also viewed another video I prepared for configuring Ethernet IP explicit messaging with the data exchange function block. In this case, you can skip the first introduction chapter, which is identical in this other video. Before we begin the demonstration, let's briefly discuss when explicit messaging could be required or could be useful for your projects. As reference information, this is a network layout of the equipment configured for the purpose of this demonstration. Communication between an M580 EPAC and a TSYS-T motor controller is configured for Ethernet IP protocol with implicit messaging through the use of an EDS file and its associated DTM object. However, additional information from a field device, including drives, robot controllers, or the TSYS-T unit of our example, is only available through explicit messaging. This is the case of some diagnostic information or data to identify the device, such as its MAC address. We might also want to identify the CPU and the NOC modules in this M580 PLC, specifically with their MAC address and firmware version. So, to remotely identify the CPU and NOC modules via the supervision network, explicit messaging will help us to make this data available in the PLC's registers, even when the NOC module connected to the supervision network does not have its communication enabled with the Ethernet bus of the backplane. For your reference as well, the software and firmware versions successfully tested for this demonstration are listed on this slide. So if we take a look at the sample program that I prepared for the demonstration, you'll notice that this is an M580 PLC in which the processor, the CPU, has a DTM object used to scan data or to obtain data from a TCST motor controller using implicit Ethernet IP messaging you'll see that we are getting data in real time. And this has been done by using a DTM produced by the act of importing an EDS file that has a series of assemblies available with predefined registers. You can actually select when you add a connection which of those assemblies you would prefer to use. Now, in some cases, you might require some additional information that is not necessarily available through these predefined assemblies for Ethernet IP. For example, we could take a look at the manual for the TSYS-T motor protection unit, and you'll notice that there is information that is arranged in an object dictionary with information that can be available using Ethernet IP explicit messaging. This additional information is grouped using different class codes. So one of the first parameters that you might need to know to find this information or to address appropriately these registers is finding out in which class code the information can be found. So if we further look into one example, in the case of the TSYS-T of one of the class codes, we have the Ethernet link object, which is identified with hexadecimal F6 class code. Within this class code, there are up to two instances, number one and number two, which are two identical groups of data, each one containing this series of attributes. And in our case, what we'll be interested in looking for is the MAC address, which is identified with the attribute of hexadecimal value three. Another interesting example is the firmware version of the TCST device, as well as diagnostic error codes or the number of messages exchanged with the device. Having this capability of detecting the MAC address or the firmware of a field device could be helpful to generate an alert if there has been an unauthorized replacement of the device. This could also help to improve the management of the assets in the control system. Going back to our PLC configuration, it also happens that the CPU and the NOC modules in the M580 controller have the same type of object dictionary. This could be extremely useful to remotely access the identity information of the processor or other modules on the PLC backplane that may not be directly connected to the supervision network. This is precisely the case in my sample project where we assume that the NOC module is connected to the external SCADA system, but the connection to the Ethernet bus on the backplane is disabled. 
In this scenario, since the NOC301 module is isolated from the Ethernet network of the CPU, it will not be possible to remotely view the embedded web page of the CPU or connect online to its DTM to find out what is the MAC address or its firmware version. However, if we use the explicit communication function blocks within the PLC logic, it will be able to access this information, then make it available as PLC registers that can be accessed by the SCADA system through the data dictionary or localized memory words. One important detail to consider when using explicit messaging is that there is a maximum number of communication function blocks that can be simultaneously active at any given time. And this includes the sum of all types of explicit messaging, including Ethernet, such as Modbus TCP or Ethernet IP, as well as CAN Open or Modbus Serial Communication. This means that you might need to add some logic in the PLC program to control how many and when the function blocks are triggered, and perhaps even monitor an activity bit before triggering additional function blocks and then avoid exceeding the communication buffer of the CPU. Furthermore, the maximum number of simultaneous explicit messaging function blocks is documented in the user guides for each one of the processors and Ethernet communication modules. In the case of the M580 CPUs, it varies from 16 to 96, depending on the CPU model. Then in the case of the BME NOC 301 or 311 modules, the maximum number is 16. It is also the case for the BME NOC 321 module, maximum number of 16. And then we have the BMX NOC 0401 module used for the M340 PLC also with a maximum of 16 simultaneous requests shared between Modbus TCP and Ethernet IP. Two solutions are available to implement Ethernet IP explicit messaging. One of them is by the use of the data exchange function block. As I mentioned before, there is a bit related to the activity or the status of the function block. In this example that I'm showing on the screen, it is being used to make sure that the operation or the transaction of the data exchange function block has been finished before triggering it again. Secondly, when using the data exchange function block, there's a very important structure that is connected to the very bottom pin. Here's where we will manage parameters such as the timeout for the communications of the function block and every time it's going to be triggered or initialized, we need to move a value into one of the words of that array or structure, indicating the number of words that's going to be sent out the query of the data exchange function block. Lastly, through another structure connected to one of the input pins of the data exchange function block, here's where we're going to be able to enter the values of the class instance and attribute that are going to be used to find the information within the object dictionary of the device. As for the use of the general purpose library, when using Ethernet IP explicit messaging, you basically combine two types of function blocks. One of them is the client profile function block for which typically you would have one instance for each memory location for each type of query with its class instance and attribute parameters. And then all of these instances of client function blocks are going to be connected through a work memory variable and all communications leaving the communication port are going to be managed by a single port profile function block which is managing the number of simultaneous queries active at a given time. So if we compare these two methods side by side, in the first case for the data exchange function block, you will notice that the communication parameters, such as class, instance, and attribute, must be passed on to an array following a very specific syntax, and this will be done through the fourth input pin with the data to send array of the data exchange function block. Secondly, the user must manage the number of simultaneous queries that are being sent out to the communication port. So there might be additional logic that the PLC programmer has to include to uh, control the way in that these uh, data exchange function blocks are being triggered. Thirdly, the data exchange function block does not include any integrated statistics, such as indicating the number of messages that have been successful or with errors or the average time spent during the communication. In that case, the PLC programmer could add some logic to calculate these statistics. 
based on uh, communication reports, error codes, the activity bit, or transaction numbers. One advantage, though, is that there is a much smaller memory requirement when we compare it to the implementation of explicit messaging using the function blocks of the GPL. As for the GPL function block, one big advantage is that the communication parameters are entered directly as values in four of the inputs, such as the service ID, class, instance, and attribute. Also, there is a port profile function block that is going to take on the responsibility of managing how many simultaneous queries are being sent out the communication port. So there's a, a less of a need of custom logic to be added to control how the function blocks are being triggered. There's also an additional function block available that calculates the statistics related to the use of each one of the client function blocks. And there's no need for the user to then calculate how many messages have been successful or with errors or the average time to send out the messages. One detail to uh, look out for, however, is that using the GPL function blocks is going to create some large structures in uh, the program memory. So you might want to check the free space available in the processor as you develop your program. Now let's move on to the demonstration on how to configure explicit messaging for Ethernet IP protocol using the general purpose library. First of all, I would like to mention that the general purpose library is not pre-installed as of today in Control Expert. So you must go to our Exchange website in order to download the files to install the general purpose library. Once you get to the web page for the Exchange platform, look for General Purpose and select the General Purpose Library version 2 for Ecostructure Control Expert. Here you will find a tab for documents and videos, and a very important document is a guide for the installation of the GPL library within Control Expert. So you'll have a step by step guide on how to do this. You will be able to install the family file into Control Expert. You will find the required function blocks within Control Expert. You will also need to use certain project settings in order to use the GPL in your project. Regarding supporting documentation, please refer to the Communication Components User Guide, where you will find details and specifications of the three types of function blocks that are used together for Ethernet IP explicit messaging. For instance, you'll see the description of the Ethernet client function block with the meaning of each one of the inputs and outputs and how they can be applied, as well as information for the statistic counter function block that provides details about the number of messages that have been sent successfully or with errors, as well as the average time spent in the communication transactions. So if we look at the initial version of our M580 PLC program, I have already applied the required settings in order to use the resources of general purpose library, specifically in the common and in the variables project settings. For our demonstration, we will be looking at two values from the M580 processor. One will be the firmware in the CPU, as well as the MAC address, this last one available in class F6, hexadecimal, instance one, and attribute three, according to the user guide for the M580 processors. So let's start by creating a new section, which we will call Diag's CPU, and it will include the client type function blocks that will query the information from the processor. Next thing we do is add a timer, which is going to control the frequency at which the communication function blocks are going to be triggered. In this case, each time it reaches the preset time, it's going to reset itself. That's why we need to negate the input to the timer. And then we're going to code a preset time of five seconds for this timer. Then we could use a rising edge detection function block to be enabled whenever the timer has reached its preset time value. This signal is going to then be used to trigger the client function block from the GPL, which we can add with the function block input assistant, and we will be able to locate it by navigating to the general purpose library folder and then the communications folder. 
you will see there's only one Ethernet IP client function block, which we then add into our logic. Following best practices, the instance name would have a prefix that we define, followed by underscore, and then the name of the function block itself. Next, we interconnect the rising edge detection function block with our Ethernet IP client function block. And then we can start populating the values and the structures associated to the pins of the function block. We start by entering the service code and the class instance and attribute parameters, which can be in hexadecimal or decimal format. Then we add the device address, which will be the IP address of the target within single quotes and curly brackets. As for priority, typically a number of three is used for read operations as opposed to two or one for write operations. The length is used more for uh, write type of messages and it defines the number of bytes that are being sent out using the query for Ethernet IP. As for the remaining pins, we can simply create the name of the variables associated to each input and output pin following a syntax in which we use a constant prefix, in this case, diag cpu one underscore, and then the name of the pin itself. One exception to this name and convention is the variable at the input pin at the very bottom, which will take the variable for the work memory input of the port client function block, which we still need to create. For now, let's call that variable as Ethernet CPU underscore work memory, and then we will make sure to use that same variable name for the port profile function block. And now we continue to create the rest of the variable names following the naming convention by typing the prefix diag CPU one underscore followed by the name of the output pin. The next function block is optional, but it's extremely useful to diagnose the correct operation of the client function block. We can also find it within the general purpose library folder, the communications folder, and then it's going to be almost the last one, the statistic counter number one function block. So we follow the same convention. We add the prefix diag CPU one to the name of the instance of the function block, and then just as we did before, we will create the variables for the input and output pins following the convention of prefix underscore and then the name of the pin. Lastly, the way to interconnect the Ethernet IP client with the statistic counter function block is going to be by using the name of the variable that is created on the output pin for the statistic connector of the client function block and type in the same name at the input of the statistic counter function block. One last step to prepare our Ethernet IP client function block will be to make sure that the array that will receive the data sent by the field device is large enough or has enough fields. Otherwise, if the information that is being sent by the field device is larger than the array available in the logic, the Ethernet IP function block is going to fail. Next step is to add our port profile function block, and we need to use the same variable name that we linked to the last input on the Ethernet IP client function block. So once we copy that variable name, we're going to create a new section. This section is going to be placed after all of the Ethernet IP client function blocks that are going to be linked to that port profile function block. So we can find our port profile function block using the function block input assistant. And in the same manner as we did before, we can go into the general purpose library folder and then the communications folder within that. Notice that we have several options here. The number at the end is the difference between the different port profile function blocks. And then we will select the one that has at the end the number of 16 because that's the capacity that the CPU that we are working with has. We will give a name to that instance following the best practices of a prefix selected by us, followed by underscore and the name of the function block itself. Now we can add to the last input pin on the bottom left, the exact same variable name that we used for that work memory input pin on all of our client function blocks that are going to be linked to this port function block. And we can continue to create the variables for each one of the inputs and outputs.
We can simply follow that naming convention where we will first add a prefix, in this case, Ethernet CPU that we selected, followed by underscore, followed by the name of the input or output pin as you see it displayed in the function block on the screen. Next, there are some important communication parameters that are going to have to be set in the engineering parameter structure, which is connected to the fourth input pin of the port function block. We can inspect this structure using the data editor, and you'll notice there are three fields that we can control. The first field is the port address, in this case 0.0.3 .0 .0 for CPU, or 0.slotnumber.0 .0 for a NOC module. The second field is the number of simultaneous messages that can be sent, and the third one is the timeout parameter. So what I chose to do for this example is to use move function blocks to transfer values into each one of these fields, particularly the first two. In the case of the address, we will use 0.0.3 .0 for the Ethernet port embedded in the CPU. As for the simultaneous messages being sent, I chose to add or transfer a value of 8, although there is a capacity of 16 that can be provided by the function block. And as for the timeout, if nothing is specified, if a value of 0 is entered, then uh, the function block will default to a timeout of 3 seconds. And now we can proceed to build the changes in our application. And since we are connected online with our controller, the program is also going to be transferred at the same time to the PLC. And now that the program has been downloaded, we can create an animation table to monitor the results. We can right click on uh, the port function block and create an animation table directly from there. And we can then go to the data editor and copy paste the name of the additional variables, in this case, the Diag CPU1 group that we had created for our client function block. So we just need to paste the name of these variables in our animation table to see the information. And what you'll see in the response data for our client function block is in a hexadecimal format, a value of hexadecimal 14, which is value of 20 hexadecimal, and 03. And these values correspond to the major and minor revisions of the firmware. So it's firmware 3.20. And if we wanted to verify that on the animation tab of the CPU, given the fact that we are connected online, we can confirm that the firmware version is 3.20. And if we go back to our animation table, we can take a look at some of the diagnostic information. For example, in the fail code structure, we see that all the values are zero, so communication is correct. We have a statistic data array in which we have the count of messages that have been considered OK or messages in error. So in this case, no messages were sent in error. And we have the minimum, average, and maximum time counted for sending these uh, communication transactions. We also have a similar structure for the port function block itself. So we practically see the same statistics for the Ethernet port itself because we only have one client function block associated to the port function block. And lastly, we see that the engineering parameters were transferred correctly to the port function block as we had defined. And now let's check the percentage of memory that is available for data. Using the memory consumption tool, we are now down to 78.6% of free data memory available. The next step will be to add a second instance of the client function block in order to obtain the MAC address of the CPU. And for this, we can naturally copy and paste the logic that we had prepared for our first example. And then you'll notice that in these copies of the instances of the function blocks will have an added underscore zero on its name. I recommend that you modify the data properties of these function blocks and remove the underscore zero and rather modify the prefix, in, in this case, changing from Diag CPU1 to Diag CPU2. This is not strictly mandatory, but it will come really useful when you are integrating the Control Expert GPL with the general purpose library for Aviva System Platform and OMI.
And now we can start modifying the values and variables connected to the input and output pins. The service ID will not change, but class instance and attribute need to be updated as per the documentation to obtain the MAC address of the CPU. And as for the variables that we have created and connected to the input and output pins, we can keep the same type of syntax or structure, but we do need to replace the prefix from Diag CPU 1 to Diag CPU 2. And this is just my take on a standard procedure on how to give a name to each one of these uh, structures in a very consistent way. And then the variable name for the work memory input, which is at the bottom left, it's going to remain the same because we are connecting this new Ethernet IP client function block with the exact same port function block that we have already configured before. And then we continue in the same manner to rename the variables on the outputs of this new Ethernet IP client function block, as well as the associated statistic counter function block. There is one detail, though, that you should take into consideration when using this method of uh, copy-paste the logic. It so happens that some of the arrays, particularly the response data array, is not created automatically with a size large enough for the data that you might be requiring from the field device. So always remember to adjust it. And now we proceed as usual. We're going to copy paste the name of the variables into our animation table and proceed to build the changes to the application, which will be downloaded to the PLC since we are connected online. And once the program has completed its download, we can then go to our animation table and in the respond data array, just set up the correct format, in this case hexadecimal, to view the values of each one of the octets of the MAC address in the, of the CPU in this example. Now, notice that when we added the second instance of the Ethernet IP client function block, the free space for data storage remained practically the same. It only changed from 78.6% to 78.3%. To finish our demonstration, we will very quickly replicate the logic that we have already defined for the CPU and do the same for the BME NOC module. So we're going to start rather from the section containing the function block for the port control. And then we proceed just as we did before by correcting the name of the instance of the function block with the correct prefix, removing the underscore zero added at the end as well as the name of the variables connected to the input and output pins with the appropriate prefix, in this case, Ethernet NOC, for each one of the variables associated to the port function block, as well as the move function blocks that are being used. One important difference is that the port address that's going to be transferred into the communication parameters is now going to be 0.2.0, .0 because the NOC module is at slot 2 of the backplane. Next, we could create a section of logic where we will place the client profile function blocks for the NOC module. And a, a very important detail is that we must make sure that this section of logic is going to be executed before the section that includes the port profile function blocks, and that's why we're moving it upwards. And then, as we have done before, we could copy and paste some of the logic that we have already defined, in this case from the logic section for the CPU, and bring that into our new section for the diagnostics of the NOC module. And just as before, we can correct the names of the instances for each one of the function blocks. Then we will need to replace the IP address, which now should be the IP address of the NOC module and not the one of the CPU. And we continue to correct the prefixes for all of the variable names, in this case with Diag NOC1. And we continue updating the variables, this time on the output pins of our first Ethernet IP client function block, as well as on the statistic counter function block. Now, the first function block on this section of logic is going to read the firmware version of the NOC module. And here you see the final results for the second function block, which is obtaining the MAC address for the NOC module. 
Now we proceed to go to the data editor and modify the response data arrays to make sure that they have a size that is larger than the data that we expect to receive. So we're going to update the size of two integer elements to a size of 10 elements. Lastly, we can select the variables that have been just created in our data editor and then right click to add them into a new animation table, which we can now monitor once we download the changes to the PLC. And once we're ready, we can build the changes of the application. And since we are connected online with the PLC, the program is going to be automatically downloaded. So an interesting detail when I was working on this proof of concept on a test bench, I happened to uh, not have anything connected to the Ethernet ports of the NOC module, and I was just getting zeros as values returned for the function blocks for the NOC module. As soon as I connected a device on the Ethernet ports of the NOC module, I began getting the results as expected. And once we select uh, the display format as hexadecimal, we can correctly interpret the value of the firmware for the NOC module, which would be number two as major revision and decimal value 20 or hexadecimal 14 as the minor revision. So firmware 2.20. And then for the MAC address, again, we select as display format hexadecimal values, and we can correctly interpret the MAC address as displayed in the animation table. Finally, I recommend that you review the usage of memory, especially for the data declaration. In a previous step, we had a percentage of free memory available of 78.3%. Now we are left with 56.3%. So it's something to consider, especially in programs where you're going to make extensive usage of the GPL function blocks, you might want to consider selecting a model of a CPU that has more internal memory available. Let us finish with one more recommendation to correctly configure the GPL function blocks for explicit messaging in an M580 hot standby controller. The comment displayed on the screen is from the documentation of the general purpose library, specifically the communications function blocks and the Modbus and Modbus TCP explicit messaging function blocks. Although it is not part of the description of the Ethernet IP explicit messaging function blocks, I do recommend that you consider it as an added precaution when configuring an M580 hot standby PLC. This basically has two implications. First of all, if we check the configuration settings for the M580 hot standby CPU, specifically in the hot standby tab, you can set up which sections of logic are going to be executed in both primary and standby processors. So the recommended setting in this case would be first section as the only list of logic sections that would be executed in both primary and standby. Secondly, when we look at the different sections of logic that have been configured for the mass task, in the very first one, we must not include any of the function blocks of the GPL for explicit messaging. This concludes our presentation, but before I bid you farewell, I wanted to also share a great source of information with pre-recorded webinars that can be useful for you. These you would find on the schneiderelectric.com website localized for Canada. So after typing .se.com, please add slash CA. And once you're on our landing page, please click on the support tab and then look for the innovation summits link. Once the Innovation Summits link is open, you can scroll down and you will find these pre-recorded webinars, which you can filter with keywords such as syslog. You can also search for Builder, where I present the Architecture Builder software, as well as some of the specifications for M340 and M580 PLCs. Also, if you type in the keyword cyber, you will find several presentations, including one of mine called Cybersecurity in the New Normal, where I do a quick review of cybersecurity applied to industrial control systems. Lastly, if you would like to learn more about new features and control expert, you will be able to find a webinar demonstrating the use of the read remote and write remote function blocks using multiple simulators. Many thanks for taking the time for watching this video, which I trust will help you during the development of your projects.
Thank you.